At this time, I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Scottsdale Unified School District. It's January 15th, 2013. The time is 3.11. Um, I'm going to kind of go off script at this, po at this point, and if I could ask uh, the members of our student advisory board who are with us today to lead us in the pledge, if they'd come forward. Um, Isabel carter Khan, Tennyson Holloway, Aditya Vijay, and Evelyn Karras. And I'll have a roll call starting from far right. You need to turn your mic on. Sorry. George Jackson. Barbara Perleberg. Denny Brown. Sam Kirby. And um, Board Member Sneed unfortunately could not join us today as she has jury duty for the next four days. Okay, at this time, do any of the board members have any changes to the agenda? No. Changes? No. Nope. So, uh, if there are no changes, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. I'll second. Board Member Brown moves to approve the agenda. Board Member Jackson seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda is approved with a vote of 4 to 0. Dr. Peterson, recognitions and celebrations. Thank you, Madam President. Um, we do have several uh, celebrations that we would like to have. First, uh, Carla Partridge has a um, couple of updates and celebrations that she would like to share. Good afternoon, Madam President, Governing Board members, Dr. Peterson and Sandra. I have two celebrations today, and the first being with our, for our wonderful superintendent, and that we are proud to announce that our, David, um, our superintendent, David Peterson, has been named a finalist in the eSchool News 2013 Tech Savvy Superintendent Awards Program. In order to be considered for the award, candidates must demonstrate exemplary vision for the use of technology to improve all facets of education and show outstanding leadership in working to make this vision a reality. The winner will be announced in February. Good luck, Dr. Peterson. <laughs> the next update I have is on our Sci Tech Fest, which is coming up in February. And we're excited that we're going to be participating in the Arizona Sci Tech Festival for the second year. In February, each of our learning communities will host a science and technology expo showcasing the work of our students. We strongly encourage parents, family, friends, and community members to attend to see the exciting projects that our students are doing. Discovery Education will have booth at each ex expo and volunteers to answer science and technology related questions. The eCoach will also be present at all the events. Uh, the Arcadia Learning Community be, will be held on Thursday, February 7th from 6 to 8 at Arcadia High School. The Saguaro Learning Community event is Thursday, February 7th, 6 to 8 at Mojave Middle School. The Desert Mountain Learning Community Expo is on Wednesday, February 13th from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Desert Mountain High School. The Coronado Learning Community event is on Wednesday, February 13th from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Coronado High School. And the Chaparral Learning Community Expo is on Wednesday, February 20th from 5 to 7 p.m. at Chaparral High School. We hope that all of you will attend these outstanding events. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Next, um, Mr. Rick Freeman, our uh, Director of Facilities Operations Construction, is going to um, present uh, a, a recognition that's well-deserved. Um, we have a new director of transportation who has come in and he kept the wheels not only spinning, but um, he kept them moving forward and he's doing an incredible job and we're just very, very proud of what um, Bert Herzog has been able to do for us. So, Rick? Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Peterson, Mrs. Como, and Bert Herzog, will you please come up front here with me, please? As Bert makes his way up here, I want to let you know that the Arizona Department of Public Safety requires every year a safety inspection of all of our buses. 
Each bus is, goes through an extensive inspection, which includes air brakes, tire depth, checking for air leaks, belts, fuel pumps, intake valves, filters, lights. Make sure they have a fully equipped first aid kit. Make sure we have bodily fluid kits. Make sure we've got uh, uh, triangles and markers and things, just to name a few things that they go through. And this year, Bert and his team was able to reduce both the number of major and minor infractions on our school buses to zero. All of our buses in our fleet of 200 buses received a perfect score this year. And we would like to commend Bert and his team for the job well done for the Scottsdale School District. And Bert, here's a certificate for you. Thank you. Also, I'm going to introduce a member of his team. Here's Chris Stevens. Chris, stand back up for a minute. Chris is a big part, too. Thank Thanks. I, I think what's most um, important about this recognition for the team transportation is that um, we took over vehicle maintenance starting on 1 July. We used to contract it out. And we decided after looking at it, we could do it better, we could do it cheaper, and in fact, we are doing it better, and we are doing it more economically and cheaper, and we're saving money. So um, team transportation, way to go. You guys keep the wheels on the bus going round and round. <laughs> Finally, I would like to um, just recognize a program that we had today. Uh, here's the poster from our Youth Voices uh, program that we had. It was held at Saguaro High School. Our keynote speaker was Mr. Steve Pemberton. He's the Chief Diversity Officer and Divisional Vice President for Walgreens. His message this morning was truly inspirational. Um, he touched on his life growing up and how that life is pretty similar to a lot of our students in our audience. Uh, I was very proud that we were able to share this event with high schools across the valley. And we actually have high schools that come to us um, and, and look forward every year. Matter of fact, we had a couple schools that called us at the last moment and said, you know what, we didn't get an invitation, but we're coming anyway. And I, I think that speaks volumes for the work that um, Cliff McKenzie had done, for the work that Michelle Marshall has done to help put that together. The event included amazing student performances by the Saguaro Symphonic Orchestra, the Saguaro Dance Company, and Voices of Saguaro, and the National Award Winning Concert Choir from Saguaro High School. Uh, the pr program is hosted by our service learning program and our service learning students and we are very, very proud of everything that um, our service learning students are doing to show that Scottsdale does it better. So um, great program today and this evening and the reason why we're having our board meeting um, this afternoon is tonight is the uh, Community Celebrating Diversity event, the Martin, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. dinner that um, Mr. Pemberton will be talking at and there will be some recognitions of community members at that that our school board members will be attending. So um, just a great event and I just wanted to recognize everybody uh, and celebrate uh, a wonderful day that um, we had to showcase Scottsdale Schools. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. At this time um, is when we have reserved for public comment. Mrs. Cohen, do we have any cards? No. Okay, we have no public comment cards, so we'll move right along. Um, Dr. Peterson for superintendent's comments. Thank you. Madam President, members of the board, um, I'm pleased to announce that we've worked really hard this year to focus on, again, tax credit and getting our tax credit contributions um, into the district. Our community has responded overwhelmingly, and we're very, very excited for that. Uh, we've actually seen a 15% increase of our tax um, credit contributions from the previous year. We are um, approaching $2.7 million and we still have checks that are being opened and balances being finalized. So we're very excited for that. We would like to thank our public relations and marketing department for getting the word out. And also um, Mrs. Kim Hartman and Mrs. Gwen Parker. There are uh, two champion uh, parents that we have from Chaparral Learning Community and they've really done a good job of working with all of our schools to make that happen. And, and really it's amazing to think that we have almost three million dollars that have come to us to be able to put programs in for students that we normally would not have otherwise. So we're very very thankful and grateful for our community for supporting our students. Also um, it's hard to believe but we're here on the 15th of January we are a week and a half into our second semester. 
We had a great start of our second semester. It's a little cold this week, but um, we're doing well. We've only had a couple of burst pipes um, at a couple places, but overall we did really, really well. I'd like to thank our building services folks because the first day of school, and Murphy and I are always best friends, so something always happens. Um, Yavapai Elementary School, the first day of second semester, did not have electrical power when we started that campus. And our building services folks worked with the staff at Yavapai. Kids were safe. We got, them, we got some electrical going in some of the areas. We kept them warm and then brought the rest of the campus up. So school and learning continued. We did not miss a day of learning. So I, I just want to recognize our building services department for the work they're doing there. I am proud to announce that um, through some of the efforts of Dr. Anley Forlis and um, Melissa Sackos that um, we submitted a grant to the Helios Foundation for a science grant and we have been notified that we are a finalist. There was, uh, I believe, roughly 300 applications that were submitted and 15 of those are picked as finalists. So Andy has done a wonderful job of putting that together and um, to be selected 15 out of 300 was, was spectacular. They are coming to visit with us um, in a couple of weeks, aren't they, Andy? February 22nd, they will be here to visit and, and to do a site visit um, as, as they look for us to be a finalist. Also, um, this Wednesday is a professional development early release day in Scottsdale schools, and I can tell you it's an all-out effort. Dr. Benson has done a wonderful job with her curriculum team, and we have pages upon pages upon pages of where people are going, what programs are going to happen, what professional development is going to take place. And I'm just proud to say that um, there are so many wonderful things that are happening. And we have teachers that are teaching teachers. And they're just doing incredible work. So thank you for all of our staff out there for wanting to do better, wanting to learn better, and wanting to make a difference for kids. Um, and then I would like to thank Bonnie. Um, she's not here today, but she's at jury duty, but I'd like to thank her for her service as a, our board president this last year. I'd like to welcome Pam Kirby as our new board president for this coming year. And also, I'd like to welcome George and Barbara at their first official board meeting um, here taking care of business. So again, we have a wonderful community that steps up because they get paid a huge salary to be our board members and, um, and, and they do it um, every day with a smile. So thank all of you for your service and we look forward to a wonderful year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, at this time we move on to the consent agenda. We had nothing pulled from consent, so do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. <laughs> I have a motion by board member Jackson. Do I have a second? Second. Board member Brown seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda is approved with a vote of four to zero. Um, information discussion items. The first item is a student advisory board update to the governing board. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Um, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Forlis work with our student advisory board and they meet and our students are incredible. Uh, not only are they leaders on their campuses, but um, they are not shy and they share some very good information with us. Um, they, they basically tell us like it is, which is what we need to have and, and have that honest feedback. So um, Dr. Thomas is going to start and then he's going to introduce the student advisory board folks that will give you a, a, a presentation of what they are currently doing and where they're going this year. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Madam President, members of the governing board, Dr. Peterson, Sandra, and guest. Um, this is one of the favorite things that Dr. Forlis and I get to do in our job, and that is working with our student advisory board. Um, it's hard to believe, but we are in our third year of the student advisory board, uh, and in that three-year time, it's been amazing what they've been able to accomplish. Um, but I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm going to let them tell you about that themselves. But I want, I want to share um, a, a little story in that we had a meeting the other night, and we had Dr. Sackos um, and Dr. Ballas, pre Dr. Ballas present some information regarding um, students, um, and it was amazing to watch the dialogue between our students and professionals around what's happening within our high schools, what their concerns are. It was textbook of what good work our kids do and the quality education that we have in the school district. Um, I'm going to start maybe videotaping those meetings because it's pretty, pretty darn impressive. But just to watch the dialogue and the high level of questions that our students asked uh, was amazing. 
Um, at this point, I would like to introduce Isabel Carter Kahn, who is the president of the Student Advisory Board, and she's going to give you a presentation on what the Student Advisory Board has been doing over the last several months. Isabel? Thank you, Dr. Thomas, um, Madam President, members of the board. Um, I'm Isabel Carter Kahn, president of the Student Advisory Board. Um, with me today is uh, Evelyn Karras, another member, Aditya Vijay, Vice President, and Tennyson Holloway. We're all from Chaparral. Um, uh, at first, I want to start out with just telling you a little bit about who we are as a group. Um, we have representatives from every high school in the district. Um, between all of us, are, we have an average of 10.1 uh, years of schooling in the district. Um, we all participate in many different extracurricular activities. You can see the list is enormous, and that's just from people who are at one of our meetings. Um, most of us hold at least one leadership position. We have nine presidents of other extracurriculars. Uh, we have six sports captains. Many of our members work, and we have representatives on many committees for the district. Um, that's actually become a big part of our meetings. Uh, the people who are on the committees come back to our meetings with feedback from everyone who's on the committees, and we uh, share our opinions on matters of the committee with those people, and they can bring it back with um, a more rounded view of student opinions. Um, and our average GPA is 4.3, so we're very proud of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> the main thing we've been working on right now uh, is trying to set up an intramural sports um, in, within the district. Our goal is to involve students who are not otherwise involved in extracurriculars. Um, obviously, as you saw, we're very involved, but we know there are many students who are not, and those tend to be students who um, fall back in schooling. So we are trying to involve students and also give students an opportunity to become active if they don't have the time or the money for club sports or varsity sports at school. Um, one of the ways we've tried to um, get information from the different schools that we represent is through Facebook. Um, it's obviously very hard for us to get information from student bodies, at, at least at Chaparral. We have you know, over 2,000 students. And um, one of the ways we try to do you know, outreach is, is Facebook. Uh, it's an example of one of our Facebook pages. We have one for each school. Uh, each school has between 50 and over 100 likes on it, so that's how many people can see it. Uh, we've been using polls on Facebook to try to get information back. Um, this is an example of one that we're using for our intramural sports. Um, okay, and then the last thing we've been doing is our student survey, which Brian has talked to you about last year, um, our previous president. Last year, we had a trial of many teachers. This year, we're trying to expand it. Uh, we have over 50 teachers signed up so far. It's a student survey um, that students take to evaluate teacher performance that only the teachers see, and we're trying to give feedback to teachers. So thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me or... Are there any questions from the board? Um, I have a question. K did you have one? Well, go ahead. No, no. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, you mentioned intramural sports and getting kids involved that may not necessarily be on the, the um, school teams. But what about, um, I just wondered if you have ideas as far as arts and music and, you know, those kids who, you know, maybe haven't found their spot on campus for those interests as well? For music groups? Yeah, well, music, arts, um, you know, art, young artists or something like that that, that may have not found their club or, or mm -hmm. something like that. I just wondered if that was kind of included in the idea of, of getting um, students. Um, I think our goal was to have something with a really broad appeal and sports is a um, low commitment type sport that will still get you active. Is something that has a very broad appeal and it can involve students that aren't interested in art too or even are interested in art. Just trying to get everyone involved. Well, it's very impressive and, and your, your group is excellent. 
doing yeah. excellent work. Thank you. Um, that was one question I had. Um, another question is, do you have a timeline that you're targeting as far as to complete your surveys, get the feedback, and then develop a proposal or recommendation? Yes. Um, we are trying to get the surveys out within this quarter. Um, once we have every teacher that we can signed up, then we can send those out. Um, the feedback we get is, um, it's broad, but it's limited. We got feedback from last year. Only the teachers can see specific um, questions that we, like each student has answered. So we get um, am amalgamated data. Um, last year, it was very positive. Um, we're expecting the same result this year. So when we get that positive feedback, um, the only thing we can do is really recommend we still have some teacher hesitancy with privacy of, and not wanting it to be a, a punitive thing if the feedback isn't positive. Um, so we will come up with a recommendation by the end of this year. Thank you very much. I always enjoy having you guys come to our meetings and I look forward to you coming back later on this year. Thank, Thank you. you. The next information discussion and if I item. Could, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I wanted to, to close the section, uh, Mrs. Kirby. The, the thing that's really impressive about the Student Advisory Board is they're actually very intuitive. As an example, if we go back when the board was um, uh, going over the decision around the 2.0 GPA policy, this was one of the first groups that deliberated over that and they commented and talked about what the impact was on their students and that's part of where they came up with let's try intramurals because our colleagues, our fellow students, the ones that seem to be not engaged, let's see if we can come up with an opportunity. So that wasn't um, a proposal that just came out of thin air. They really were very thoughtful and, and paying attention to what was happening, what the governing board was doing. So I wanted just to, to close with that. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, annual open meeting law training. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Um, as you know, uh, being a public governing body in Arizona, there is a requirement every year that we do have open meeting law training. Um, so Mrs. Marshall, um, every year sharpens that pencil and is happy to get up here and give us our annual training. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, Madam President, members of the board. Um, I want to thank Sandra or whoever put me after the Student Advisory Board great presentation for the riveting Open Meeting Law Annual Review. Um, feel free to stop me along the way if you have any questions. Uh, this is a review for most of you. Uh, the Open Meeting Law generally says all meetings shall be open to the public. Pretty straightforward. Any legal action taken by the board needs to happen in public. And legal action is defined as a collective decision, commitment, or promise made by a public body, you. Um, a little bit further discussion of what legal action is. Any discussions, deliberations, considerations, or consultations among a majority of you, so three of you represents a quorum, that may foreseeably require final action by the entire board uh, is, is legal action that needs to happen at a public meeting. The public policy of the state is to uh, interpret this statute in favor of open meetings, so if there's ever a question, the meeting should be held in public. Who is covered? You as a board are covered. And just a reminder that any advisory committees that you create are also covered by open meeting law and have to follow the rules of posting notices and letting the public know and come to those meetings. As you all know, there's an exception in the law for student matters. Those are uh, very private matters, and the state statute recognizes that discipline, suspension, and expulsion of pupils can be had in a closed session. We have to post notice of our meetings at least 24 hours in advance. I believe the most recent revision to the law is this, um, this clarification that the 24-hour period can include Saturdays for districts like, like us that have a physical posting accessible to the public. And also, um, we like to put it on our website so that people can go online and see that. Notice has to be specific, easy to understand. Um, generally, it's a violation for the board uh, to discuss anything at a meeting that hasn't been properly noticed for the meeting. 
Meetings and notices should be accessible to persons with disabilities. We can have an executive session for certain enumerated matters uh, set forth in statute. Executive session just means that we can have a quorum of the board meet in private for those specific um, exceptions that are set forth in statute. Only those individuals who are necessary to that matter should attend an executive session. There are seven enumerated reasons that we can have an executive session. I won't go through every single one of those. I'm happy to tell you what those are. Um, but I, I wanted to highlight the most common. Um, one is discussion or consideration of employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, et cetera, of a public officer, appointee, or employee of any public body. Another very common one is for legal advice. You get to talk to me in private. Um, that recognizes the attorney-client privilege. Another one is meet and confer, and this is the language of the statute, discussions or consultation with designated representatives to discuss meet and confer items. Notice of the executive session has to say exactly which provision we're meeting under. Um, it can't just be a blanket, we're meeting under that general statute. Um, we do include on all of our public meetings uh, a, a note that we may vote to, you may vote to convene an executive session for legal advice should something come up during a public meeting. So that's okay that we have that on every regular public meeting notice. Calls to the public, a reminder that the public has the right to attend and listen. They actually do not have the right to speak at your meetings. Um, if the board, as our board has, decided to include a call to the public, we can limit the amount of time given to each speaker. Speakers can talk on just about any topic, but the board may not really substantively respond unless it's a, a matter that's been noticed on that, that agenda. Um, board members may, however, respond to criticism that's been um, issued against staff members, and they can ask staff to put something, uh, review a matter, or ask that it be put on a future agenda. Email. Um, I, I usually try to be overly cautious and blind copy you when I communicate with you because of the whole uh, issue that can happen with reply all. You might mistakenly um, talk to a quorum of your of your peers about a, a matter. I know you are all very careful about that, but just a reminder that email is one of those places where, where human beings tend to get pretty casual, and so it's easy to forget um, this uh, issue of the open meeting law. What happens if we violate the open meeting law? Uh, the statute provides that all legal action taken in violation of an open meeting law is null and void unless the board subsequently ratifies that action. So the board can fix it by ratifying it. Um, a court can impose $500 fines for each violation against any person uh, who violated the, the open meeting law. That fine cannot be paid for or reimbursed by the district. It, it, it is a fine for the individual. The court can also order payment of attorney's fees and costs. Um, and again, the, the district cannot pay for those costs. In extreme cases, if, the court, if a court determines that a public officer violated open meeting law with the intent to deprive the public of information or the opportunity to be heard, they can take the extreme measure of removing the member um, from, the, from office. With that, I'll take any questions. Fun stuff, I know. I have one light on. Turned it off, okay. A mistaken light? <laughs> <laughs> Got excited there for a minute, didn't he? I thought I was going to get to answer your question. Okay. I actually have a quick question. Sure. Would you speak um, more? Uh, it's a perception of violations. For example, um, if three board members went and had coffee, I know that in, we're talking about sports or the, uh, you know, the NFL game. Is that something we should avoid, or is that it could be perceived if some, you know, there's three board members meeting outside this meeting? Is that something right. that we need to be careful about? You do need to be careful. It's not to say that you can't do that, um, but that's a good point that somebody, a member of the public, could see three of you together and think, oh, well, this big issue is coming up on the next agenda, I wonder. Um, and anybody can contact. 
uh, the authorities and say, I think something happened, um, and they may or may not choose to investigate. But that doesn't mean you can't go for coffee with your colleagues. Thank you. Brown? You know, if it, when in doubt, if we thought there might be a chance where three of us could be in the same room, um, it's usually wise to call Sandra. <laughs> Hey Sandra, we're three of us are going to be in a room, you know, just uh, just for future reference. And Sandra does do. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say I do post um, for um, district events um, where their board members will be present, but it's always this is a courtesy. It's not it's something not that I have to it, is that's required. That helps. Any other questions or comments? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have one action item on the agenda. It's an update on construction progress and approval of the construction of a new maintenance and transportation building at the Apache Complex through the One Government Procurement Alliance contract. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Um, as you know, back in 2010, we did pass a middle school bond that also had some other ancillary projects on it. Um, you're going to, and, and as part of that, we've had some savings. So I've asked Rick Freeman, who's overseen all of that work, to, to not only give us an update on the construction progress, but um, we have a proposal for some of that savings um, to be utilized in a high need areas. And so Rick is going to give you a presentation on that. Also, I'd like to um, remind the board uh, and new members that we do have a bond oversight committee and that is a committee of community members and also um, uh, our architects, our, our contractors go to that, our district administration folks go to that and it meets quarterly and that board is, um, it, Sandra posts those meetings because we may have board members that go there um, and you're welcome to come to it but they go over all of the projects, they go over all of the schedules, they go over where we are progress wise um, dollar wise and then the bond oversight committee gives guidance as to what we should be doing uh, as we move forward um, and so we, we've had that it's worked very very well as a matter of fact a lot of other school districts have modeled um, taken that model that we've done and utilized it just so that they can um, not get themselves in trouble it also helps us follow the law because every October we're supposed to have a public meeting regarding those capital type of expenditures um, and and we have that by having our bond oversight quarterly meeting so Rick um, come on up and um, give us your update of where we are with the bond um, and also he's going to give a little bit of where we're heading in the future based on some enrollment and, and some data that we have um, been working on for a, a future bond Madam President members of the board Dr. Peterson Mrs. Como I'm happy to be with you today to give you a little snippet anyway of the things that have been taking place. As Dr. Peterson mentioned, in 2010, the voters in the Scottsdale area approved a $118 million bond for improvements to be made to uh, many of our facilities in the school district. Uh, at that point in time, we started diligently working on plans and things, and beginning in uh, May of 2011, we started digging in the dirt. Uh, making some of these improvements. Uh, a few pictures of things. This is Arcadia Neighborhood Learning Center. This is the architect's rendition of, of what he proposed the facility to look like for an improvement. We totally rebuilt that facility. This is the actual picture of the facility once it was completed as we finished that up this last September and uh, made a dramatic improvement to the neighborhood in that particular area. Another project here is down at Supai Middle School. Supai Middle School, we had some classroom wings up on the northeast corner of the campus that we totally went in and we gutted and we remodeled those facilities and we've improved them to be able to accept our sixth graders as we move into this new school year. The area of the picture that you see in the middle is of the new fine arts area where the band and art departments are. The lower right hand corner is what the finished product looks like from the outside of that facility. And on this page right here, we went in and we gutted the interior space of the administration building. We opened up the lobby. We made a, a more point of presence for that school uh, so that people would know where they were and we, we've created a better flow of traffic as well as a more secured campus at that location. 
-hmm. At Yavapai Elementary School, Yavapai Elementary School, we went in and we did quite a bit of work at that facility. Initially, we built a new multi-purpose building, which contained a central plant with a new chiller to provide air conditioning for all the classroom wings because that uh, facility was suffering from poor mechanical uh, abilities. We also uh, remodeled the front administration area. We opened up the lobby at that school and recreated a better flow in the front office. That's what this picture is that you see before you. The lower left-hand corner is a picture after we had demoed the existing sidewalks and then the, the uh, picture in the back set is what the new office area looks like now. We also at that facility went through and we renovated all of the classrooms. We brought them into the 21st century with new lighting, insulated windows, carpeting, uh, did a lot of design work and so forth in those rooms and, and brought those up to good standards. This facility right here is at the Tavon Annex. Behind the classroom row over at Tavon is a, what was a vacant lot that we were using to store uh, materials, surplus items, playground equipment, different things that were of value and of use to the district, but that's where we were keeping them. In many cases around the district, we will have pieces of furniture that don't necessarily fit into a classroom. And in past years, sometimes those things were put in places where they were damaged by weather conditions and things. We now have this Tavon Annex facility to be used to st uh, store some of those surplus items and keep them out of the weather. Um, some additional projects that are on the list here. We did uh, some major mechanical work for the administration areas at Copper Ridge, Anasazi, Desert Canyon. Uh, we also replaced all the roofs over at the Copper, I mean, sorry, at uh, Desert Canyon Middle School. We put new roofs on that facility. Saguaro, we put a new roof on that uh, gymnasium. Cherokee, we did major work at Cherokee with a major mechanical retrofit and new electrical service in that school. Uh, the service for electrical was put in many, many years ago, and it was really in a struggling condition. District-wide, we went through nearly every facility in the district and we updated the lighting in all of the parking lots by putting in new LED parking lot light fixtures. We put a lot of light fixtures on the building, which not only improved the lighting of those campuses, but it reduced the energy consumption of those schools. We also seal-coated and, in some cases, completely removed and repaved the parking lots to bring them up to standards. At Desert Mountain High School, we did exterior weatherproofing, which what that really means is we went through and we painted the whole school and stopped the rainwater from going through the stucco, but we repainted the place. We had an expansion to a couple of the art rooms up there, and we replaced the all-weather track out at the football field. It was degrading very badly, and we've removed that and we replaced that track. Mountainside Middle School, we went through and did a modernization of all the classrooms. We painted, we put new carpet in, we put new hardware on doors to make them more secure. We did some auditorium renovations, which opened up the auditorium for, for better use and better able to get more people to that, to that venue. We also did exterior weatherproofing. And then on the athletic field that's south of the campus, uh, we came in and we put some topsoil on that because that particular rocky part of the neighborhood, we had a lot of rocks and things coming through. We made it a safer condition for our students to be able to play on. And along with that, we put in a terraced area so that parents and, and uh, faculty members and so forth could come and watch the activities that were taking place on that field. The bond projects, many bond packages or projects are completed at this time, but we still have some projects that are underway. Uh, currently, we have Cocoa Palm Middle School. Now, Cocoa Palm Middle School has been a multi-phase project. We had moved in nearly a year ago into a two-story classroom building. We took, they took down some other classrooms. This is a picture before all the work started back in May of 11. And it's hard to believe if you were to go out there today what changes have really happened to that campus. But during this, during this time, uh, on, when we came back from the winter break, we actually moved into the new portions of the campus. We're moved into the second of the two-story classroom buildings. This picture that you see here is of the new library space at Cocopa. And this picture here is of the second of the two new two-story classroom buildings that we moved into at that facility. We also moved into a brand new cafeteria and kitchen area. And at this point in time, we are uh, working on demolition and we've got six more classrooms to construct. And we've got, a, uh, we've got a new courtyard area at the school to put in, but we're winding down on that project and that project will be completed this summer. This facility here is Mojave. 
Mojave, you, you know, we've been, had a multi-phase project on it. We completed a new MDA here a year, a year or so ago. Uh, we, we also, the, in that picture on the upper right-hand corner, you see the gray building with the black roof. That particular building is the new two-story classroom building, and below that's the new library. This picture was taken in August. Well, over October break, we moved into that facility, that new area where we're all moved into. And then if you take a look at the center of the picture, when I get ready to change the page, you can see where all the classroom wings and classroom buildings were located prior to winter break. And then as we approached winter break, we made dramatic changes to that facility. All those existing buildings went away. And we are right now digging in the dirt, putting in footings and pipelines and things to get the new administration area added into that campus. And then we've got new parking lots and things that will be going into there. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we are steadily working on that, and that will also be completed this, this summer. Here's a couple more pictures. You see the two-story classroom building uh, in a couple of those pictures. And then something I want to draw your attention to down here on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, at Mojave, we had some kachinas that were inlaid with tile into some of the walls. And in order to, to keep some of the history of that facility, we rep replicated that kachina that's on the library building right there at that facility. So some of the history is still there with, with Mojave. This is a picture taken in August of Ingleside Middle School. Now, if you recall, we moved into Ingleside Middle Stu School two-story classroom building back at the start of the school year this year. Well, I've taken a picture here. I took a picture across the area looking at the two-story picture in the background, two-story building in the background. And we've diligently been working on the new gymnasium building and the new administration area. Well, a photograph that I took last week that I placed in here on the left-hand side is the new gymnasium at that facility. Uh, the right-hand building that you see there in, in the picture, that's the new administration area. We are steadily working on that, and we are slated actually to move into those new buildings over the spring break, which will be coming up on March the 11th through the 15th. So those things are going on. Um, something that I want to add into that, and I shouldn't have changed pages, but I'll keep talking to you about it. Something that happened over the 2010 bond program, and even going back to our 2004 po bond program, we've been able to achieve completions and things on these buildings. We might have had a fire drill or two that we didn't really suspect, but during all the construction on the same sites, while kids are in place, we've maintained a safe environment for kids, and we've not lost a day of education through all this work. A part of the bond proposal and part of the bond program was to replace some of our um, bus buses in the district. We have replaced buses. We have 20 new, I think they're 84 passenger buses. We have one large handicap bus, and we're waiting on the delivery for, 17, uh, for seven new uh, activity buses that are on their way. So that was part of our bond, bond program. The voters did in 2010. They approved the bond, the sale of the bond for $118 million. Presently today, we have realized with negotiating and working on these projects, a savings of $3,018,000. Uh, we do stand to perhaps on a couple of our projects still, uh, we still may be able to save a little bit more money as we work into these projects. We're still dealing with these things. But that brings us to another particular area. With those proposed, or with those savings that we have, we have a couple of projects that we've proposed. The one that's on the agenda to today is a transportation maintenance facility at Apache. And also I've included in here a new multi-purpose kitchen building, which would be at Tonalee Elementary School. We're not necessarily ready to bring that information to you at this time, but I wanted you to be aware that that's out there forthcoming. But Apache, the, our facility at Apache, if you take a look at a couple of pictures that I have here, um, right now, Apache, we house 81 buses at that location. From the pictures, you can see this is our maintenance facility at Apache. Um, we are basically able to change light bulbs and batteries at that location right now. Um, and so that's part of the proposal as to why we are looking towards a, a facility. If you take a look at this aerial photograph, you can see where our buses are parked in that facility. And I'm not sure if it comes out on your computers or not, but uh, over the last several years, we've actually had to add additional parking spaces to that location. On the right-hand side of that page, in that upper photograph, 
upper portion of the photograph, you can see the difference in the asphalt in that particular picture. That's an area that we had to add for, I believe we've got 26 buses that are parked there because of the number of buses we have in the district. Approximately 40% of our fleet is contained down at the Apache site, which the 81 buses from our fleet of 200, that's quite a few units. We're proposing a new maintenance facility, as you see in that photograph, to be located on what our, ten our uh, basketball courts in that picture right now. We would relocate those basketball courts that are there a little bit farther to the south and create an environment or an area where we can pull those buses into for servicing, maintenance, and repair. Uh, here's a footprint of the facility that's proposed. Uh, it would be a two-bay uh, maintenance facility where we could pull buses in. Um, and then we have a small office, a restroom, and a part storage area at that facility. Um, right now, if we have a bus that breaks down at that facility, or that, that breaks down and it's, it's housed at that location, uh, we have to uh, either work on it in the parking lot in, the, in that particular area, or we have to hook it up to a tow truck and have it, we have to hire a tow to get it back up to the San Salvador location to have repairs made. What lies ahead? That was our bond information that we have. And as we look ahead to what's going on with our district, um, you know, we're moving our sixth graders out of some of our elementary schools and we're moving them into our middle schools. That creates a little bit of differences at our, at our uh, elementary schools. So we've taken a look at some of our schools. Um, at our capacities and how we're utilizing our facilities. Um, we did get census information um, from the government and we have our proposed pre-census information here about our enrollment projections for our school district. And as you notice, our enrollment projections from the census have actually gone up a little bit. Few more students would be coming into our district based on that information. So we need to make sure that we can house these students in our particular schools. As we move on, our cur a current snapshot during November and December of 2011, we did a snapshot of our facilities. We had enrollment at our 20 of our sites at uh, 12,575 uh, 12, students. With our equivalent space of 118.74 square feet per student. Well, some might ask, well, what does the state recommend in square footage for students? The Arizona School Facilities Board allocation for classrooms for our students is at 90 square feet per student. So you, you take a look at those particular things and you say, well, you've got too many square feet for the number of students that you'd be placing into your programs. As we move our sixth graders into the middle schools, that's going to decrease our enrollment numbers at our elementary schools because of moving them. As I switch the page over here, I give a, a, there's a table, um, a current snapshot of what we have. For instance, the first one is Anasazi. Our current area at Anasazi is 70,833 square feet. The school facilities board capacity says that we can have 787 students at that school. And our projected enrollment for 2014 is 669. Well, a person might be led to believe that, hey, you got too many square feet at that school. You can put a whole bunch of other students in there. Well, as we look down through the road, there's some things that we have to remember in our, in our statistics and in, in our square footages and things. The state, the uh, school facilities board, they don't recognize some of the things that we have in programs. For instance, special education, a self-contained special education room, it may have 10 students in it, but it has the same square footage of a classroom that has 30 students in it. They don't take that into consideration when we look at our space. All day kindergarten, the state looks at kindergarten as a half a day program. So if you have 25 kids in a half a day program in the morning and 25 kids in a half a day program in the afternoon, that's 50 students. But we offer in Scottsdale all day kindergarten. So that takes from our square footages at that point. Our ELL, four hour block programs, enrichment and support, also computer, computer areas for assessment they don't include those into some of the square footages. So as we look at our capacities of our school, we're trying to look towards what actually do we need to run our programs. Now on this page here, 
there's a suge- well there's some thoughts that we can take a look at some of our facilities we have some some schools on this list that have really reached the end of their life expectancy and they really need some attention um, as we as we take a look at them also um, there's things that we need to do to the facilities to bring them into the 21st century but as we take a look at those we want to look at right sizing the facilities <laughs> And you say, well, exactly what does right sizing mean? Well, we take a look at those uh, enrollment projections. We take a look at those neighborhoods. And there's some of the areas here that we would actually be building schools that are a little bit less in square footage based on what we have there. Now, we know from history that if you give a school X amount of square feet, they're going to fill X amount of square feet with programs and with, with storage, if you will but we need to make sure that we can maintain square footages for our students that can operate the programs as we have outlined here in the district. That is basically my presentation, and I'm open to any questions that you might have. Mr. Freeman, thank you for your presentation. Do we have questions or comments? Mr. Brown? Uh, on behalf of all the students at Mojave, my big question is, is there a pool on the roof? No, sir, there's no pull on the roof. All right, then. I'm glad we cleared the air on that. Now, moving right along. So, it is, as you might know, I work at a church, a very large campus, and recently we upgraded all of our lighting. Uh, went from T12 fixtures to T8. Yes. Uh, we, I'm going to assume that we did that typical or that similar upgrading with all of this rebuild. Yeah, we, we installed T8s and T5s throughout our rebuild. So we've got those more ener energy efficient light fixtures, as well as in our parking lots and those particular areas, we have installed either inductive or we've installed LED light fixtures, which are very, very energy efficient. All ex exterior buildings, yes, sir. Well, now, I understand that's a huge dollar savings in for our energy bills. That is correct. So that in combination with our solar panels, that, that's really huge for the district. I gotta imagine that's a massive savings. We believe we will save um, several hundred thousand dollars more a year in our utility bills with that lighting upgrade. Cool. And we got rebates back from the utility companies for doing it. I was gonna ask if the rebates came into play. That's great. Um, so how many buses are up at San Salvador? San Salvador, we've got, I believe, uh, 119, 120. And how many are we, pr are we proposing to store down at Apache? Apache, we already have 81 buses at Apache. And so there's a, there are service bays in San Salvador, and we don't have San, servants? San Salvador, yes, sir. We, we do have service bays at San Salvador. That is where our maintenance, oil changes, all the repair work, and all that takes place is up at San Salvador. So what we're doing is we, we'd like to add services down here so we're not towing these buses back and forth or even putting miles on them, I would assume. That is correct, yes, sir. Great. Uh, and just to clarify, so all these capacity numbers on all these schools does not include kindergarten pre-K? Um, or, or it's, it's it, the, twisted? The, when, when you look at the square footages that the state allows us for our facilities, it does not include all-day kindergarten, and it does not include any pre-K. So if we have a pre-K program at our school and we look at the square footage, our square footage is, the numbers may look a little skewed because we may have 118 square feet as opposed to what the state's saying of, of 90 square feet per student. And just to go back, I may have had a senior moment going back to demographic studies. Didn't our growth show in the south uh, primarily that was going to show the most potential for growth? Yes, Madam President, Board Member Brown. Um, we are going to see growth occur in the southern area. Desert Mountain High School is where we will see a, a decrease just because of the aging neighborhoods. And, and as, as Mr. Freeman stated, when that 90 square feet per student was developed by the School Facilities Board back in 1998, um, it was done as a minimum adequacy guideline. It wasn't done as this is optimal, it was a minimum adequacy, because remember the state had to pay to build facilities for schools who didn't have adequate square footage. And so, um, and I, I helped develop those guidelines. When we did that, it was minimum adequacy. Um, since then, they, they, you know, we have, we have to have two classrooms for the same number of kindergarten students because we have all day kindergarten for them. Right. Um, 
preschool. We have tuition-based preschool that's making dollars for the district. We have to have classrooms for them that the state does not recognize. And so we're putting all that together and, and looking at our facilities and our capacities, knowing what we're going to be done. And um, we have some facilities that need some help. Tonali is, a, is in dire need, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't it one of the oldest? It is, yes, sir. And it has almost no work has done, taken place there over the last well, Board Member Brown and members of the board, Madam President, if you remember back in the fall, we had a situation take place at Tonalia that we had a small fire in an electrical panel. At that particular facility, it, it needs some attention. We need to look at it in the future. And that's part of the proposal that we would like to be bringing to you here shortly about some additional work to take place at that facility with some of our savings dollars. I just appreciate all your hard work, buddy. And I know that the caring you. that you put into buildings. Thanks. Thank you. Um, board Member Perleberg. Thank you very much. Um, as a new member, I'd like to, uh, some clarification on the definition of the, s the square footage allocation. Is that simply um, classrooms? Would that include multi-purpose buildings? Includes, that does include all of the facilities, all, the, all of the spaces at that school. So caf cafeteria, yes, storage, offices, and, Library, and any multi-purpose. Yes. Um, so in your proposed square footage, um, would those include a lot of these older schools? Have, they have no real multipurpose rooms on those hot days for PE classes and things like that. It, are the, is that included in that square footage? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the new, new facilities for multipurpose rooms and those things are included in those numbers that we have, even in the right size. Okay, that's wonderful. And then my final question is a couple of these um, just like Ms. Brown was mentioning in the South, there is growth somewhat expected, and a couple of these schools don't seem, with the proposed square footage, to have any room for growth. And I wondered um, if, if there was a, any specific reasoning for that, or? I'm trying to remember how we put all of our numbers together, but we did include for growth in those places. We, we looked at the sixth graders that would be leaving and what numbers would actually be in that facility as we worked up these, as we worked up these numbers. Yeah. B. Well, I, yeah, I'm just looking at the one where you have design capacity, you know, the proposed square footage, design capacity, and then enrollment on the final column, I assume that's current enrollment, or is that projected? No, that is that projected is, that enrollment is projected. Thank based you. on yes. the demographic study. Thank you very much. Um, Board Member Jackson. Mr. Freeman, that's a very impressive uh, presentation. You're doing wonderful work. Thank you. So I want to thank you for that. Um, my question is, um, my predecessor, um, Ms. Peterson, had said when I first joined the board, she talked about always putting students' interests first, which we all do, of course. But my question, I think, is um, with the perfect audit we just received um, on, from the Transportation Department, which is incredible, frankly, um, and this money that if I'm left over from the 2010 bond, is that money it's clearly we're doing everything right with the buses at the moment and, and maintaining the, the school buses. Could that money be used possibly in its classrooms right now? We don't have a, another bond uh, pass at this point and possibly uh, the bus maintenance facility down south be put off um, f until a future bond issue. It's just a question um, because you know, we, we do have this money, and, and I think there's some classrooms that probably could desperately need that money. Mr. Jackson, thank you very much. Members of the board, Madam President, um, you, you are right. Money could be put into, everybody's scrambling for dollars. We all grab for dollars to put in this location and put in that location. One thing that has become very apparent to us as we've taken over the maintenance of our buses is we don't have the support in the south area of the district as we need it. Right now, like I say, we can change light bulbs and batteries and anything that needs to happen to the buses. Really, they either have to be towed or they have to be driven up to San Salvador. Now, it doesn't seem like a big dollar amount, but a round trip on a bus just for fuel and the labor to drive it there is costing us $55. 
$55 is nothing, but when you multiply that out times all those units, that costs us quite a bit of money. When they make for normal routine maintenance between five and six trips to the San Salvador facility, we start to encumber a little bit of dollars. Um, we believe at this time that our money would be well spent to put that facility with the construction costs and things that we're able to achieve today for a metal type modular pre-constructed building that would go out on that slab and be able to save us some of those expenses, modernize the stuff for our mechanics to be able to service them there, reduce some of that travel and that transportation back and forth, but be on site, be on scene for all of our staff members that are there. Um, you know, like I said earlier, 40% of our bus fleet is at that location. We can do anything. We can fix, we can overhaul stuff where it's at. Is it the most, is it the best condition for a person to be able to be working in? Is it a good environment for our staff members? Probably not. I'll share a little story with you, and I hope you don't slap me down, Dr. Peterson, but when I was a boy, I remember going out, I remember going out to the fields where my grandfather was working. And I remember him crawling out from underneath the tractor, all greasy and dirty, because that's where he had to work. I'd like to see our folks that are trying to maintain our buses to get our boys and girls back to and from school. I'd like to see them be able to have a place where they don't have to lay on the hot asphalt when it's 110 degrees, when they can work on a bus, where they can change the tires, where we're not having to hire a tow truck to pull it back up to that location. Um, I, I truly believe with my, all my heart that the Apache location, we have reached a point where we need that vehicle support at that facility. Not that our classrooms don't need it, but we truly have that area of need there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Board Member Brown. Well, so with the money saved from the trips back and forth, that money can get to the classroom. Right? Yeah, th that, would, that would be budget money that we could utilize elsewhere. Yes, sir. So we're spending it here to save it so we can use that savings here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you on, for the presentation and also for what you and your team do all year long. Um, you know, you come under budget in the 2010 bond by $3 million on time or early on every project and no lost learning days. You've hit the trifecta. So thank you for your efforts. You. Um, Dr. Peterson mentioned at the opening of this agenda item the bond committee. So my question is, um, I think I know the answer, but I want to ask the question. Did the bond committee make the recommendation to spend the, um, a, the leftover, if you will, three million from the 2010 bond I and mean, prioritize the Apache maintenance facility. Yes, ma'am. At our last bond oversight committee meeting, that was presented to the bond, uh, the oversight committee folks, and they were in agreement with that, with that decision to use those savings, because it was the savings, to be able to apply to actually those two projects. Okay, so they, they were presented more than just the Apache. They had a, yes, a, a buffet of different, of different alternatives. Of different things, yes, ma'am. Okay, um, and then just as a clarification, Dr. Peterson did some quick math over here. On this slide right here, for the guests in the room, I, I do believe the totals on the proposed square footage, um, I think there's a transposition of numbers there. It should be 525, 950. It probably is. Okay. I probably fat fingered that when I <laughs> plugged those in. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I was racing. I changed this yesterday, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments from the board? Very impressive, thank you. Okay, hey, so um, at this time, do I have a motion to approve agenda item 11A, update on construction progress and, progress and approval of the construction of a new maintenance and transportation building at the Apache Complex? I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes with a vote of 4-0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, future action. Do I have a request from any board member for a future action item? I see no lights, okay. And um, do I have any governing board reports? 
Okay. And then dates of upcoming meetings. If you want to get your calendars out. We have Tuesday, February 12th at 4 p.m. is a study session, and that same day at 5 p.m. is the regular governing board meeting. And then on March 19th, 4 p.m. study session, 5 p.m. regular governing board meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>